Hello everybody, welcome back. This is our first chapter for principles of macroeconomics. In the last video, we did a brief introduction into everything that we're going to be covering. And then we talked a little bit about economics as a profession and economists and what they do and who they collaborate with, um, with a few notes about um, grad school um, and careers. So in this in this video, we're jumping into the, the content of the chapter, um, talking about economics quite generally, the difference between micro and macroeconomics, and we're going to jump into a small section at the end about um, the differences between economic systems. And so um, let's go ahead and jump in here with the very beginning. So our definition of economics. Um, and here we're going to be defining it as the study of how humans make decisions in the face of scarcity. How humans make decisions in the face of scarcity. Okay, um, this is maybe a little different than what you might expect for the definition of economics if you've never had an economics course before. Economics is not all just the study of money. Um, in fact, you can have a, an entire career studying economics and think very little about mo money um, and the monetary process. Uh, it's really about human behavior, um, human action, and the interactions between people in, in a society. Um, and so we're thinking about how we make decisions, and ultimately it all comes down to this idea of scarcity. Because we have scarce resources, and we're going to give a whole bunch of examples here in a second, we face trade-offs in, in what we can have. So this interaction and these trade-offs that we face form the foundation in, in how we're studying economics. So things are scarce. Uh, we can't have everything. There, there's a limited amount of, of nearly everything. And so just a few examples of scarce resources. Um, well, one, we can talk about natural resources, which is a first uh, kind of natural reaction, thinking about scarce resources. Natural resources. So there's scarcity in the amount of, for example, fresh water, oil, trees, um, etc. Right, minerals, um, all sorts of all sorts of related natural resources. Um, one that goes kind of along with that, which I'll, I'll go ahead and put next, uh, is land. So land is a scarce resource, um, perhaps one of the scarcest. It's, it's not 100% uh, scarce. Um, theoretically, we could make more land. Um, we can certainly make more usable land, right? If, if we want land for uh, housing development, the city kind of extends and we have this urban sprawl. If we want to make more land for agriculture, you know, we can, we, well, we actually see um, in places where they tear down forests to make room for um, arable land, agricultural land. Um, and then there are even extreme cases of actual creation of new land. Um, and so, for example, you have island building in the South China Sea, the Netherlands has uh, has built islands on which they build entire cities, um, and Dubai is another example in the United Arab Emirates, uh, which has also done some some island building where uh, you actually create new land. Um, so land is scarce, very scarce. Um, but again, when there are, when the trade offs are high enough uh, to create more land. Um, and the, the, basically the price and the benefit of more land is high enough, um, we can actually create new land. Um, so natural resources, land, are a couple of, uh, a couple of examples of scarce resources. We also have all types of consumer goods. 
right? Um, for example, computers, cars, um, you know, clothing, food, um, et cetera, et cetera. This list can go on uh, forever. Um, there are all the things that we have in our life as a consumer good, as a product, all of these things are scarce um, and and there's a limited number of them. So we have scarce goods there. And I want to add two more. Um, another example is money. So um, there's a fixed amount of money. The money supply can change, but it is scarce. Uh, obviously, if it were, were unlimited, uh, there there's going to be some implications there, which we'll actually end up talking about once we start talking about monetary policy. Uh, but money is scarce. And the last thing I want to say is also time. Time is scarce. There's only 24 hours in a day. Um, and so we have to make trade-offs, right? And all of this comes back to the idea of making trade-offs. If we want to have a brand new computer, that means maybe we're going to have to give up some clothing. So every time we are making decisions, we're trading something off. Um, and it's because of scarcity. And economics is the study of all of these interactions. Okay, so goods are scarce, and what we're thinking about here is how, how do we obtain these scarce resources? Ultimately, this comes down to two, I guess, primary ways. Uh, one, we could buy it, right? Um, that's just, you know, consumption. We could also make it. So kind of self-production there. Um, let's ignore the other alternatives, uh, which are basically taking it, right, um, in a reasonable fashion, we have two options, we can make it or buy it, and, um, this is going to bring us to our next section where we're talking about the division and specialization of labor, uh, but if you imagine everything that you have, uh, even a small subset of the things that you have in your life, if you decided to try to make everything, um, you're not going to be able to have nearly as much um, things, as much variety, and at such a low cost, all the things that you have in your life. Uh, producing a single item all by yourself can be extremely uh, time-consuming. And again, that's coming back to this decision between... Um, how we spend our time and, and the scarcity of resources. Uh, so what we do instead is we specialize in whatever, whatever it is we're good at. We get a job doing that, make money, and then with that money, we buy the other things that we want. So we don't make all of our own clothes. We don't make all of our food from scratch. We certainly don't make all of our electronics uh, and all sorts of other goods. So we specialize in what we're good at. And once we do that, we end up being able to buy the things that we, uh, the other things that we need. So I would encourage you to go out, um, search this uh, video on YouTube, how to make a $1,500 sandwich in only six months. And essentially it's the guy doing exactly that. He's growing the grain by himself, threshing it, uh, grinding it into flour and making his own bread. <clears throat> He's going out collecting honey he goes to the ocean to collect seawater to make salt uh, and everything along the process to make to make a single sandwich. And as you can see in the title, it takes him $1,500 in six months to do so. Um, so certainly not very efficient. Um, and in the end, uh, he he claims his, his sandwich is basically uh, decent or or kind of okay. Um, and so instead, what he could do is specialize in what he's good at. And in his case, it's uh, actually making um, YouTube videos, but then going out and buying sandwiches from people who specialize in making them. So everyone in the society kind of specializes in what they're good at. We divide our labor, and then we trade with each other. 
um, in order to kind of obtain the goods and services that we need. Okay, so how are these benefiting us? Um, I'm going to show uh, a few a few examples here. So how is uh, the specialization of labor beneficial? First, it allows workers to focus on the parts of the production process where they have an advantage. It allows workers to focus on the parts of the production process where they have an advantage. Okay, so it allows you to do things that you're good at, right? Um, next, workers who specialize in certain tasks often learn to produce more quickly and with higher quality. More quickly and with higher quality. Okay. If all you're doing is making um, sandwiches all day, you're going to become quite good at making sandwiches. Um, in a similar fashion, if all you're doing is, well, say, um, teaching, then you're going to be learning teaching methods. You're going to learn uh, how people like to learn. You're going to understand the types of questions people have. You can specialize in that and provide the service with a higher quality. Um, as another example, you can see other videos on YouTube where people are uh, chopping onions all day and they can just rapid fire chop an onion in just a few seconds. Um, so a number of possible examples there, but through specialization of labor, people produce more quickly and with higher quality. Third, uh, specialization allows businesses to take advantage of economies of scale which means that as the level of production increases, the average cost of producing each good declines. The average cost of producing each good declines. Okay, um, and again, um, what we're thinking about here is, you know, suppose um, I'm making uh, my own my own clothing, right? I'm making my own shirts. If I wanted to do that, um, I could I could start by you know getting some thread, getting some um, some fabric, and just hand sewing individually each each shirt. I could then hire some employees. Um, and then maybe each person can, can specialize in one part of the production process. So one person does the sleeves, one person does the, the rest, right? One person does the hems. I scale up some more in my shirt production process, and now I buy sewing machines. And so now each person can do even more uh, rapid-fire production. I can also start buying things um, all of my equipment and my materials wholesale and in bulk to get better costs, uh, cost advantages. So if I have the ability to scale up my production process, um, the total cost is certainly going to be more, but the average cost of producing each single unit is going to go down because of all these efficiencies and what we call economies of scale. Okay, and then the last thing that we'll mention here is that it allows workers, this specialization of labor and division of labor, it allows people to focus on what they like to do and what they're good at. Um, and so they can work according to their preferences. They can produce um, what they're talented in. So again, we have more. Um, we have better quality, quicker production. Um, and as we've seen throughout the world um, and throughout history, that this idea of specialization and the division and specialization of labor, when combined with trade, uh, has done wonders throughout the world. 
Um, and this bit about being combined with trade is quite important. Obviously, I can't be uh, solely a shirt manufacturer and be left with thousands of shirts in my warehouse, um, but then not be able to trade, right? Otherwise, I can't sell those and buy the things that I need. So this only works as long as there's um, great institutions in place to allow the, the free trade of goods and services among the people in society. So it's the division and special specialization of labor and trade. Um, and so this has been a force against this idea of scarcity. Okay, um, so this is uh, certainly true at an individual level, but it's also true at a countrywide level as well. And so when countries are specializing and trading with each other, what we end up with are better prices, better prices, and more variety, uh, more variety. Okay, and just as a few examples, guacamole, I'm a, I'm a fan of guacamole, um, and I can have it year round because of specialization in trade. Um, where I'm originally from, Ohio, there's certainly not any avocado production, um, but still we import avocados largely from Mexico, um, and they're available year round. As another uh, kind of food-based example, uh, we have coffee because of trade. If we didn't trade, most of the United States wouldn't have any coffee, if any, right? So we benefit from all sorts of um, year-round produce, year-round produce. Um, so other fruits and vegetables. We have all sorts of benefits from trade with electronics. Um, TVs, computers, all sorts of uh, all sorts of electronics are produced or assembled or some combination of of many parts in the supply chain um, occur overseas. Uh, cars, we have many extra cars because of uh, because of specialization in trade. Without um, without international trade. We'd only have a, a few car manufacturers in the United States, and the smaller an industry is, um, the more concentrated market power the the few companies have, the more they're going to be able to raise prices. So, as we're going to kind of be seeing, particularly starting in the next chapter, competition is really good for consumers, right? It drives down prices, um, and it allows more variety, more specialization, um, and and diversity in products. So if we were talking about a, an American-only car market, it would just be two or three um, primary manufacturers over uh, kind of recent history. But because we trade internationally, now we have access to all the German cars, all the Japanese cars, Korean cars, and many other, um, many other places as well. So we benefit particularly... Um, through this idea of better prices and more variety in that example as well. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the idea of the specialization of labor, um, division and uh, division of labor and trade. Now let's move on and talk a little bit about microeconomics versus uh, macroeconomics. Okay. So micro really focuses on the, the actions and the trade-offs for the individual actors in the economy, primarily people, normal people. But micro is also kind of involved with thinking about firms as well. So I would say really it's individuals and firms uh, and then some combination of, of those. So individuals compose a household, individuals compose the labor supply as workers, um, and then we have businesses as well. So um, microeconomics generally has all sorts of topics. I'll, I'll just name a few. Um, 
it's not all financial economics. I mean, certainly we can have some financial economics there, thinking about household finance, thinking about uh, trade-offs um, between debt and, and income and job search and things like that. Um, but we have financial economics, we have health economics, education, um, what else? Housing and housing, let's see, housing, <clears throat> um, policy evaluation, so policy evaluation, and let's put one more set, which would be environmental and natural resource economics. Uh, just to name only a small subset. Um, so again, it's not all just studying money. Um, we're thinking about how do, how do policies, health policies, educational policies, Housing, how do people decide how they're, how they're getting to work? What are their commuting patterns? Transportation economics. Um, so all sorts of um, topics within economics. Uh, financial, or sorry, microeconomics is really dealing with the individual behaviors and the kind of firm level behaviors in topics like this, um, like these among others. Uh, but this course and, and video, these videos are focusing more on macroeconomics. So larger, broader, economic, and countrywide type of uh, topics. And so some of these are going to be GDP, which is gross domestic product, gross domestic product, Uh, unemployment. Unemployment. I'm going to put unemployment and the labor market because, as we'll see later, unemployment, the unemployment rate is only one of many uh, possible variables to measure labor market health. So let's just put, yeah, unemployment and the labor market. Let me erase that. Um, and inflation. So let me briefly mention that these are kind of the big three um, measurements within macroeconomics. So these are all things that we measure. GDP is kind of the income and the total expenditure in, in a country or in a large macroeconomy. Unemployment is how we, one of the ways in which we measure the health of the labor market. And inflation is the way which we're measuring the price level in the economy. And all three of these measurements are, are quite interconnected with each other, which we'll be seeing throughout the, throughout the course. So these are the three big, uh, the big three measurements. Um, in addition to that, we're going to be thinking about policy. So monetary policy. We'll talk about a lot. Uh, to some extent, we'll talk about fiscal policy. We'll talk about what those means and mean in just a second. Uh, but macroeconomics is also dealing with things like uh, government deficits. Government deficits. Um, and international trade, for example. Among many other things. Okay, um, so we'll be hitting a lot of this stuff in these videos. Uh, we may we may get to to some of these. Um, that'll depend somewhat on timing, but definitely everything above that we'll we'll be touching. So um, again, micro and macro they're pretty interdependent because ultimately individual behavior uh, is going to be driving. It, it drives all of us as individuals, but all of us as individuals compose an entire macro economy. Um, so what we do is affecting the entire economy as, as a whole, particularly when a lot of us decide to do the same thing. Um, so um, we're going to kind of be 
in a way talking about both uh, the entire semester uh, the entire course but um, but really focusing on the macro of everything okay um, Last thing for this video, and then I think um, for the for the last bit of this first chapter, um, I will make a second video. Uh, but let's finish off this video with fiscal and monetary policy. So fiscal policy involves government spending and taxes. Government spending and taxes. And so what we're really thinking about here is policy happening through Congress. Okay, uh, here we're thinking about things like infrastructure projects, infrastructure, uh, educational funding, education, um, military, military, um, and things like this. So kind of big uh, government spending projects that involve some kind of law to be passed or congressional budget to be passed uh, in order to send, uh, spend. And then the taxes which fund all of that. Uh, to a certain, this is primarily done through Congress. To a certain degree, um, let's put some executive branch Uh, through the president, and particularly in more recent times, over the last few um, presidential administrations, the use of the executive order has really uh, increased a lot. And the presidents have been using executive orders to basically conduct policy and even spend money um, on things which would have previously only been done by Congress. Um, but so fiscal policy is is all of this type of uh, this type of policy. Really, it's probably best to just think about this as congressional type spending, government spending, and taxes. And then next is monetary policy, which involves <clears throat> um, bank lending, bank lending, interest rates. and financial markets. And this is done through the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve. Okay, the Federal Reserve System, also known as the Fed. So when we talk about the Fed, we're not talking about the government generally. We're talking about this specific arm of the government, which is the Federal Reserve System. Um, it's composed of a chairman, a board of governors, um, and then a system of Federal Reserve banks around the country. And this, this unit called the Federal Open Market Committee, who is doing all of the monetary policy. So monetary policy, when they're doing this, they're they're buying and selling things, um, usually government bonds, government loans, basically, in the financial markets to affect interest rates and therefore kind of affect bank lending and, again, individuals' actions and behaviors within the economy. So we, we're going to have an entire section on this. We're going to have an entire section on the banking system, an entire section on uh, the mon monetary system and monetary policy. And maybe even uh, an extra section on financial crashes as well. So um, these are all things that we're going to be talking about throughout the course. Um, I'm going to leave this video here and pick it up in the next video uh, with the last section from this chapter, which is an overview of economic systems. I will see you then.